So thank you for joining this session. Um, I'm Arman Rifar, a SRE engineer at uh, Riksteve. I'm coming all the way from Moscow to here. Uh, at Riksteve we do um, TV and uh, streaming um, services. Yeah, that's what we do. And um, this is actually my second time in config management camp and first time as a speaker. And I'm a bit of like why I'm talking about crossplane here is um, I found it pretty cool and like a new futuristic way to provision um, infrastructure and do some other stuff which we will see. And I was quite surprised that like this conference is mostly about config management and infrastructure and nobody ever talked about it here. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go there and uh, I'm gonna be the first one talking about it there. So um, let me first ask this question. Um, probably everybody in a way have worked with Kubernetes, right? Yeah, see everybody nodding, yeah, <laughs> good. And um, how many of you have heard about Crossplane? Wow, and have, how many are you using Crossplane today? Right, okay, one person. <laughs> Everybody heard? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, let's get it started. Um, so today, the high-level agenda is we're going to walk through a very short intro since everybody knows about Kubernetes and then we want to look a bit more into what is crossplane and we want to maybe scratch the surface a bit on like what is the building blocks, how they work together and uh, basically um, maybe continuing with some of the new features and things that I'm kind of interested about and talking a bit about like yet the new thing, infrastructure as data um, and maybe finishing with why using crossplane and why not and what to consider. And um, before I start, I'd like to mention um, uh, that I'm not a cross-plane maintainer or like people working directly on it. I'm just basically interested and motivated in it. So, um, so that you know, I might say lots of like person, my personal opinions, which not necessarily is kind of related to cross-plane team and project uh, members. Um, okay, let's start. Um, we're going to have a quick intro on like Kubernetes, right? As you all know, Kubernetes, it started as like a container orchestration platform and then it basically was widely adopted uh, and not only doing orchestrate like pod orchestration, but like lots of other stuff. And the main reason was it's, it is vendor neutral and then it has a kind of a uniform API to define things and objects and it's has a kind of a declarative approach. And as you see, like this is a very basic example, I just wanted to put it there, um, that you describe what's your desired state of things, right? It's, um, it's, it's pretty simple to read it, to look at it. Of course, it's YAML, it's not very, how many of you don't like YAML? Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah. And then you have like one tool like kubectl that you can talk to all the objects that you create. And maybe the most important thing is like the reconciliation loop that you have the con controller libraries and runtimes that always make sure that these are the states that you describe in this YAML always, always, is, uh, always is applied to the, to the cluster, right? And maybe one of the smartest move in the Kubernetes project was the creation of the uh, extension points as called like CRDs in, in, in Kubernetes uh, that kind of opened the door to lots of other stuff in Kubernetes uh, that we can say today Kubernetes like one of the things that Kubernetes does is orchestrating pods but lots of other stuff I don't need to talk about it I guess and there were a group of people that were asking this question on 2018 that, yeah, okay, so it's about talking to an API, right? So basically Kubernetes can talk to any API and make sure, orchestrate it, do life cycles, auto heal, and all those kind of stuff. 
And they were asking this question, like, why not managing our cloud resources on Kubernetes? And um, because it is kind of like Kubernetes API and everything is kind of well suited. So you have, you have like your cloud providers API and like control plane, and then it has like one million maybe permutations of how you can use that API. And then, then you can maybe build on top of that something that can interact with that to kind of create your own opinionated, as we call control plane in this project. So we're going to talk a lot about control planes in, in Crossplane. Um, actually, Crossplane, as it's called, is a framework for building control planes. It's a bit, if you think about it, it's a bit different than automating infrastructure, right? So you are creating a control plane on top of the other cloud provider control planes. And you can basically create your custom uh, opinionated um, resources and objects and then map it to the API in your cloud provider. It uses the same declarative API of Kubernetes and um, it's basically very going to be very similar if you have, I mean as you all know that, that you have worked with Kubernetes, all the syntaxes are going to be very similar so you don't need to relearn something new and uh, maybe expose it to people in your company. Uh, I need to mention maybe at this point that Crossplane is a CNCF project. So I guess we can be rest assured that what happened in the Terraform side wouldn't happen here. Uh, just uh, the previous talk we talked about it a bit. So it, it started in 2018 and then moved to CNCF Sandbox in uh, 2020 and now it's an incubation phase. And the latest release I checked was V114.5. So it's still in the incubation phase, meaning there are lots of new features coming and going. So, the, so there are lots of things happening. There are lots of commits every day. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about it. But before going a bit deep into, into the, um, into the, maybe looking at the building blocks, I wanna, want us to think about, do we need yet another IAC slash configuration management tool? Haven't we had enough? Like, um, and that is, that is a question that I like to like, maybe try to address it in, a, in this way that if we see like a categorization of, like a very bad categorization of the tools we have seen in the past years, uh, the thing is we've been doing provisioning and config management of our infrastructure for a couple of decades, right? It's not something new. So we had like, uh, or we have, let's say, still, projects like uh, um, Puppet Chef, Ansible, uh, CF Engine, and then maybe a, a bit like after like the next generation of those on like Terraform, Pulumi, and then the CDK wave that's like, yeah, we want to use a full-fledged programming language to do it um, uh, that you can do in, in many ways with like AWS CloudFormation and CDK or Terraform CDK or Pulumi. Um, and as well, um, um, shout out to the Open Tofu guys, which are falling into this category of um, yeah, IC tools. Um, yet, I think there is like another category of control planes, which we're going to see probably more in the future. And cross plane is one of those types. And um, the way I look at it is. Um, I'm still trying to answer the question up there, right? <laughs> Just bear with me. Um, as, as our workloads, like day by day, evolve, and there are lots of people now kind of having workloads on Kubernetes, you have basically two ways. Like one way is to bend your current tools of like infrastructure and config management to be able to fit with your new workloads, or you need to find new solutions, right? And that's like the flow of it. And 
I feel kind of this is my personal, I mean, it can be debatable that um, as we move on, um, basically things in tech don't die, right? They just go into, um, they, they would become stable and then when they are stable, they are kind of losing their hype because nobody is really like talking actively about it, doing conferences because it's an unstable product and everybody's using it. A very like exaggerated example of that would be um, DNS, right? There is no hype over DNS or TCP IP and nobody is talking about, oh yeah, like there is a conference talk about TCP IP because it's basically working, right? It's an unstable product and people are using it. And, um, but in the new ones, um, there are still hype, like the, because they are trying to fill a new gap, they are trying to do something new and then things don't work, people open issues and then there are lots of commits and talks and conferences and blah blah blah, and then the same cycle probably continues. Um, so let's go into the building blocks a bit deeper. Uh, there are lots of details here. I'm just trying to kind of move you through like a very quick journey of like what this thing is and how things interact. So uh, uh, let's see how, how kind of detailed we can get. Um, the first thing here, as you noticed, we have like down there managed resources. And, and that's like basically some CRDs in Kubernetes that we get by having providers in Crossplane, it's a very famous concept of providers, right? And um, this is like a, maybe a YAML um, kind of representation of how you create a provider. In this case, uh, you have a provider for AWS S3, which gives you, creates um, API resources in your cluster for buckets, um, ACL, I don't know, whatever you can do with whatever action or like object you can have in S3 world, right? Which in crossplane setup, it's called managed resources. So that you know, so we are talking about the black box down there. And um, the provider is um, creating those CRDs and as well, it's basically a pod which, which is responsible for reconciling those CRDs that you create using that provider, right? And then the next step, or the next building block, we can say, are managed resources, right? So you see in this example, I'm creating a simple bucket. I'm just saying like API version, you see the syntax is very similar to what you do and how you package your stuff in Kubernetes, right? So the, the, the learning curve there is Basically, there is no learning here, right? Um, it has a kind, it has a metadata, the, there's a generate name, this is the name of my bucket. There are some spec, and you see the four provider parts, which is um, the parameters that your, um, that your provider actually needs to create. Like if you, you wanna say, my bucket should have versioning enabled, uh, should have publicly be accessible or blocked or whatever is like available in that provider. Um, and when you basically create it, you see, then um, you have this managed CRD, which is going to list you like all the resources that cross plane in your Kubernetes cluster is representing, which in this case is a bucket with a name, uh, if you see on the right, uh, the external name is the actual name of your bucket in AWS. And on the left, there is a different name, which is the name of the object, in, which is mapped to that bucket in your Kubernetes cluster. So this is a very simple, like one piece resource, right? But this is not enough, right? Like nothing is that simple in, in the real world. That's where compositions come in which are basically a, um, like a template of multiple managed resources stitched together. Um, you can see we have this kind composition comes from crossplane and then you can name it, like in this case, I named it Dynamo with buckets. I wanna create a Dynamo DD with my bucket now. It's not just a bucket. And you have a couple of 
Um, actually, a comment I try to like bold some of the parts. Maybe I don't know how much visible that is, but you try to see the, the bold ones. <laughs> um, so in the base part, you see I have an S3 bucket and then I have a DynamoDB, and at the end of the YAML file, I basically reference what composite resources are allowed to um, basically use this composition. And if I want to just see all the compositions I have in my cluster, I can just say get composition. This is a very still familiar syntax, right? You, you always write kubectl get pods, get deployments, and in this case you get compositions. So we are getting like moving through the, the building blocks. We've understood what are managed resources, compositions, and on the left side now we want to talk about composite resource definitions, which is actually how your um, your uh, basically you are creating a new API endpoint here, right? And this is defining how your API endpoint is, what is the schema, how, how people should interact with it, what, what's like, um, um, like what parameters it accepts and whatsoever. Um, you see in this case, for example, if I move on, I have one uh, as called in crossplane XRD, which is a CRD, but CRD was taken, so they took XRD as the short name. Um, we basically, we are defining like how my API endpoint should, should look like. And you see it's um, basically, again, very familiar like open API schema. And in this case, um, I'm telling it, uh, yeah, my bucket, or, or in this case, it's, it's a NoSQL, uh, should have a location. And it, the location should be either EU or US. I, I don't want users to write like US1 or US East 3, those kind of things. I want to just abstract from the, from the like, developers or whoever is going to use this abstraction. And basically, we move on. And the next, and maybe the, like the final building block here are composite resources and the short form of XR. If you see down like the, the, in the slide, the YAML file, uh, this is basically, if, if, I wanna, if I'm a platform team and I want to build this tool and pass it on to the developers in my company, this is basically the dev what developers should do, uh, should write to get that Dynamo with buckets. They should just call my X NoSQL API endpoints, the XRD, the, 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 the uh, resource definition that we talked about in the previous slide, and they just need to pass a location EU, and the rest we will figure out. And the same way you can see all the composites and um, when I apply this, uh, you see I get one, one composite resource object, which is like representation of this whole object. And then still you can see per resource. So you can list all your resources one by one with kubectl get managed, which is going to sh show you not your object, but all the single resources that have been created in your cluster. Well, different types of, yeah. So going back to this, I guess we are kind of completing the, the, the schema here. And um, the last piece, which is like the simplest one, is claims, which are basically composite resources, but are namespaced. So that if you want to have like more isolation for your, uh, for your resources to not be available in the whole cluster. And it's basically the same syntax. Um, but we didn't, we haven't yet talked about how that location EU was transformed to what AWS can understand, because AWS API don't understand EU, right? You need to specify what region you, you're using. Um, one, um, 
one feature which we have here, which, which later on I'm going to tell why it's going to be deprecated, um, is patch and transform. But it's, it's very, very, very like, interesting to understand what it does, which is basically the last part of this YAML file, which is basically saying, just go to that, like to my XRD and fetch that value of EU and then paste it somewhere in my composition. And then on the fly, you can transform it and say, whenever it's EU, then map it to EU West 1. Whenever it's US, map it to US East 1. And that's the actual value that your composition will use to create your resources, which you have hidden from, from whoever is using this. I think this is pretty cool, right? And you can as well um, reuse it. There is a concept of patch sets. I mean, probably this region you're going to have for all the resources. So you can create some reusable like, patch sets that you can refer all the time. And there are lots of things you can do with it, which I'm going to not go into the details here. You can basically uh, move stuff from your resource definition to the composition and vice versa. You can combine things, you can get it from your environment, which I'm going to tell what that is. And there are different like transform types you can do, like converting, matching, doing mathematical operations. Yeah. But is that all? I still, I still want to loop. I still want to condi do conditionals, right? It's, it's not, without these kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's really easy to get a composition file with like 500 uh, lines of YAML, which is probably no one of you are going to look at. Or it's, it's going to be a headache. Right? And um, one, of the, one of the conscious decisions that I guess the cross-plane team have made um, is to say no to all these requests that we want a loop, we want a conditional. And the main reason is they are trying to not grow into a new DSL. And you know how, how like, easy that can happen because it starts with a for loop and then you want something else, then people want this thing. That kind of reminds me of the early days of Terraform when you could count or do loop over some resources but not the modules and then there were, like, there, there are lots of like things. It's, you're just entering an era that's that there is no, like, uh, you cannot get out. Uh, so, um, basically, um, what, they've, what they've said, like the, the, the maintainers, was there are lots of tools that you can define Kubernetes resources in general without writing YAML. Think of Helm, um, if you're thinking about, like, packaging or customize for, like, overlaying prefer JSON or YTT, which I've not used myself, but it's a thing out there, or, or Q, which we're going to have a couple of talks, I guess, in this conference, which is pretty interesting for me, too. You can still use those stuff to generate your YAML, and that's something that's basically cross-plane and Kubernetes in general don't care about. It's just, give me the desired state. I don't care how you generate it. I don't care if you have a front-end, like a a very graphical thing that people can drag and drop stuff uh, and create it. Just give me the YAML file and that's th the rest I'll, I'll handle, right? And in addition to that, um, there was one other feature that Crossplane added, to, which was composition functions. So they wanted, they wanted users to be enabled to write their, uh, like their things that they can do in a full-fledged program language still inside Crossplane, but not rewriting a language, right? Because they are not like, I guess, language engineers or like language designers. Um, so basically what they did was enabling a feature to basically run your functions inside the composition. And those functions can be written in uh, there are, there are uh, Go and Python SDKs for it to kind of help you get it started pretty fast. And the way it works is you basically create a pipeline here and then at each step your function would get some inputs and generate some outputs. 
which are the YAML parts or like the, the, the YAML basically config that you want to generate. So if you want to loop your, your, uh, your function would get like a count and then it would loop over one um, YAML, uh, like part of your YAML and then just uh, generate something bigger for you without you needing to look at a very big thing. It's actually interesting to see, look at an example, right? This is the exact example of looping. And there are lots of uh, functions already written. And of course, you can write your own. And, uh, but for some simple use cases of like looping, conditional, those kind of stuff, uh, one, one of my favorites is this function Go templating, which you can basically use Go language to template whatever you want to do. And in this specific case, if you see my XR, like my um, composite resource that I want to create, I'm just saying, give me whatever that is, which in this example is not very clear what, that, what we want to create, but that's not the point. But whatever that is, I want count equal to. It's, it's, it's very similar to saying like, deployment replicas too, right? You, you don't know how it's done. You just know it's somehow handled in, in, in Kubernetes, right? And then what will happen is the platform team or whoever in the company who's writing the, the compositions uh, would basically need to write this pipeline in a composition and then in the bottom part, you see you have a range which you kind of doing a for loop over that observed composite resource spec count, right? So you are basically reading what is the count and then I loop through it and then I generate that bucket in this case as many times as the user wants. And then you can kind of like build on top of it, make it more complex. There are lots of things you can do with this because this is like a actual programming language. You can do variables, whatever you can think of, right? So this is like, this feature went into, if I'm not mistaken, beta in, in the, like the latest uh, uh, V114. And it's, it's still a beta feature, um, but I think it's gonna be one of like the, released as one of the like general uh, availabil availability features that we're gonna have in the, in the future. And, um, I guess by that we are kind of covered, we have kind of covered the whole picture here. So you have, um, you have an API, uh, your opinionated API of how infrastructure should look in my company. And you create an endpoint for it, which has an, a schema and a composition with however you want to do things. And, and you basically, expose it to, to the developers in your company or maybe use it in, in like building a developer platform uh, in your company so that the developers which doesn't are not necessarily interested to learn uh, yet another like HCL or DSL would have a, an easy way to kind of have like write a YAML, a very simple YAML uh, file in addition to their like service and get their infrastructure as well without you needing to do something for them or like you creating a pipeline of uh, yeah, how I want to run a Terraform, blah, blah, blah. Um, how much uh, time do I have? We have another 15 minutes. Yeah, cool. So I want to hover over some new features that we got uh, either alpha or beta in the recent um, versions of Crossplane. Um, one of them is you can't, you might end up in a situation to say, I want cross-plane to pause reconciliating my, my resource because I'm doing some operations on, on the cloud side and I don't want cross-plane to be involved in like doing anything because, because I'm reminding cross-plane is actually trying to make your infrastructure always look like whatever you write in the code. So there is like a reconciliation loop there. It's not like when I run things on my laptop, the infrastructure is gonna be created and then, then nothing. We will probably notice when it's changed or when someone has randomly deleted something and we would get some alerts probably and then we would fix it. So it's always like trying to get, get your things to the desired state that you have written in your YAML, right? 
which you can pause for a reason. And the other thing in the spec, uh, in the spec part, you can see um, this is a new feature as well, the management policies, which you can instruct Crossplane what to, what actions it's allowed to do on that resource. Is it allowed to even delete it or is it just, just a create or is it only observe a resource, which is very important and very useful when you want to import stuff to Crossplane, which I'm going to talk about. So you basically can say like how uh, basically define the boundaries of what Crossplane can do with your resources. One other feature which I found really interesting, and again, it's, these are the problems of like continuous reconciliation of infrastructure. Imagine you create an EKS node group or an auto scaling group. Probably when you create it, your desired state is one and then suddenly there is a peak or there are, there are more workload and then you, uh, you need more, right? So um, then probably Crossplane would try to get it back to one because that's what you've mentioned in the code, right? That's where you, that's where you need like init provider. So those, those configurations are the configurations that are applied only during creation of a resource, not after that. So when, when Crossplane wants to create a resource, it would say the desired state is, is one, and then, then it's not, it doesn't care about desired resource. It's, it's, out, it's out, it's not trying to kind of do anything with it. Which is very cool, I guess. It's very, very useful in some cases. And I touched upon a bit uh, on, on importing resources. This definitely is something if, if you are not using Crossplane today. The only thing you need to do is basically adding a, a resource with an annotation, as you see in, in this example. You should define your external name, meaning what is, what is my actual resource name is, which, is, which in different cases can be different depending on the provider, right? And then you specify the management uh, policy as observe only. So what Crossplane in that, that, that case do is just look at your, you look at your um, cloud resource and then try to copy over all the information it can get from it. And then uh, if you then describe that uh, resource in your, uh, in your Kubernetes cluster, you see all the configurations which you can then manage some of them uh, after. And if not, it wouldn't do anything with it, so it's just a, just a resource that it's observed. It's like, if you've worked with Terraform, um, maybe a bit more like, if you want to have like data resources to, for example, get your VPC ID or something. Um, one other thing is um, readiness checks. Um, which you can define specifically how, when Crossplane should mark your resource as ready in case you want to customize something. And the other one which I want to maybe quickly talk about it is, again, a bit better feature, um, which is called environment config. Basically, um, I guess uh, today we had a talk about it that's about like reusability of, of your uh, like infrastructure that's kind of in line with this which you can create a um, like a um, kind of a key value store of like what are the maybe some configurations that are specific to my environment it can be like prod dev stage, uh, those, like, what are my subnet uh, IDs in, in prod, or so what are, so you can basically have some kind of environments depending on, on your setup, and then just reuse those values instead of, like, getting it all over again, all the time. And quickly, you can, in, in some cases where, where um, uh, it's, it's very hard for a cross-plane to understand, for example, if there is, a, there, there is a dependency between your, for example, uh, in this case, EKS cluster and a Prometheus chart, it's kind of not apparent, right? Um, in, in those cases, you can define a usage, which, which is basically, you are telling Crossplane that these two things are dependent on each other. 
you are not allowed to destroy that thing before or, or until the, the for example in this case the chart is there you have this like a spec off and buy to kind of do it and on the left side you have like a way to say like this resource should never be deleted it's like creating a delete protection for for uh, for your resources on, on crossplay and of course some of the cloud providers kind of have that option on, on their side as well. For example, if you have an RDS, you can like enable it on AWS as well. And um, those are some of the features that I found interesting uh, that I wanted to share as well. But uh, we get to this, I'd like to show you at the end this slide. We've all, this, is, this tweet is from 2018, and I guess from, from even that time, we have became more of a YAML engineer, right? And everything is kind of YAML, especially if you enter like Kubernetes world and workloads, then you would see lots of um, YAML stuff left and right. But the real thing is, like, this is one of the core principles that you need to serialize your intentions to a computer, right? And that happened to be YAML um, in Kubernetes world. And some people are like, no, I want to use a full-fledged programming language to kind of tell my intentions to my machine. And that's fine too. There is always going to be code involved in, in, in any ways. But the way like, the way um, Kubernetes like, kind of way of uh, like manifestation works is you need to um, basically declare your intentions as, as data points, not like for loops and conditionals and variables, blah, 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 right? It's a, it's a YAML format or a JSON format or XML format, whatever that format is, is, I guess like that debate is kind of unnecessary of like, oh, YAML is this and JSON is this. It's basically a data representation format, right? You can think of like anything, right? These two, three uh, data representation formats gained popularity. No one knows how, why, right? And you basically have a form of like serializing your intentions to, in this case, like Cube API server and Kubernetes cluster. And um, we can say like, in this case, we are defining our infrastructure as data, which is a new term that I've like heard a couple of times in, in this when people are talking about like control planes and when, when you do it on Kubernetes, which makes sense. Because you can, what, at the end of the day, what you do is even your functions, they are basically parsing the YAML or like changing some of the fields, adding, combining stuff. So they are working with the, with the data, data points in your YAML setup. But don't get me wrong, we, we talked a lot about infrastructure and like specifically AWS because I've worked a lot with AWS. But there are lots of providers uh, already for crossplay. So so what I, what I like to remind you is Crossplane is a control plane solution. It's not an infrastructure automation system, right? So whatever that has an API, probably you can control it with Kubernetes and probably you can con control it with Crossplane. And there are lots of providers already uh, out there. You see some of the public clouds, uh, private clouds like OpenStack and some of the other like um, I don't know, Grafana or PagerDuty, which are like some services not related to like infrastructure at all, right? And I like to wrap up by like, why should I use Crossplane at the end, right? First of all, it's Kubernetes native, so it whatever feature you have in Kubernetes and it's is a very large community of people and services around Kubernetes that you can enable, like you can use out of the box with Crossplane as well. 
that is very important as it, it empowers cross-plane a lot. And you have a declarative config. Maybe some people don't like it. Maybe some people like it, but that's basically how things work in Kubernetes. You need to define what you want. You need to define your desired state as data, YAML, and that's it. And then you can easily build an opinionated. You can say how how the API should should basically look on my, my cluster and my infrastructure or my company. And on the top I, I see like lots of the lots of the talks that you hear about like infrastructure as uh, like IAC tools and uh, config management. Um, you get this like reconciling controllers that, that always try to make sure everything is updated on top of this, right? Which none of the kind of like um, vanilla IAC tools give you that feature like without any configuration, right? So you always need to do some pipelines or go into like use some other like side tools or go into, I don't know, Terraform Cloud to, to get those kind of features. And it's a community driven, right? So it's, it's vendor neutral and I hope it remains that way. And what to consider when, when using crossplane? Like, are there any like sharp edges as we, as we heard a lot today? Um, as you understood, it's still under heavy development. So there are lots of features that, that you, you've seen in this presentation that are still in alpha phase, which uh, cross planes kind of uh, way to look at it is like if it's in alpha we can basically drop it tomorrow and we say like no the community didn't like it so we, we are not going to continue it so it's uh, yeah things might uh, disappear I and mean, then like um, more often than the other more stable products that's how it is and Maybe you, uh, that's one point that maybe you need infra automation. Maybe you don't need control planes, right? This, is, this, is, this should be a conscious decision that you need to make. Does my company need like an actual, do, do, I, do my team or like a platform team or SRE team or whatever team I'm, I'm like managing the infrastructure, do we need to act as a gatekeeper in our, in our company and then uh, provide an API like abstraction control, abstracted control plane to the developers, or we don't need it, or, or the, our company doesn't doesn't accept this. This basically us be the gatekeeper of the other stuff. And um, yeah, what are your company needs? And of course, the developer size matters. I mean, uh, yeah. So. Um, if you're interested in crossplane and um, and uh, kind of these these topics of like how to do these stuff on Kubernetes, um, make sure you follow me or like connect with me on LinkedIn. There are I'm gonna post some interesting stuff in the coming weeks. And by this, I just want to say thank you. It was it was very nice to talk about this in Config Management.